Okay, so on this YouTube channel so far, we've done quite a few of these kind of short series. We did the versatility of teriyaki sauce first. We did Fried Rice Fridays. We've done Dumpling School. And I like them, you know, I, th I think they're really useful because they allow us to do a bit more of a deep dive into things that I think are more around process than they are about a recipe. You know, a recipe is just adding ingredients together and a method to get to a certain point. But I think once you understand the process, you learn a lot more about how to actually cook. And if you've read the title of this video, which you have because I know and you're watching it already, you know what we're here for. Welcome to Ramen School. Okay, before you complain, let me just reassure you, don't worry, those previous short series have not gone away. We're just sort of mixing up between the two. So we will be back with more Dumpling School. We will be back with more Fried Rice Fridays and more teriyaki recipes. So if you have any suggestions of what you might wanna see in those, leave it in the comments below and we'll get around to it. But they are coming back. But for now, this is ramen. Ramen has got to be one of the most interesting foods in the world, originally from China, but it's become sort of an artisan movement in Japan, there is no recipe for ramen. So I'm gonna give you some recipes here, but they're not definitive. You know, if you go to a hundred different ramen shops, you'll find a hundred different ways of making ramen. You go to a thousand different ramen shops, you'll find a thousand different ways. So ramen of all things, I think will benefit from us giving it a bit more of a deep dive into it and explaining why we're doing things. There are a lot of different ways to try to classify ramen. And they're kind of more instructive than anything else. You know, there's, there's no definitive way to say that type of ramen is exactly that because all the different permutations that go into it can create so many different types of broth. There's essentially five elements to every bowl of ramen. And those are broth, noodles, tare, oil, and toppings. The broth is pretty straightforward. It's the soup that goes into the ramen. The noodles, obviously straightforward as well. The alkaline noodles that go into the ramen. Tare is a word you might not have heard before, but tare is essentially what defines the type of ramen. It's the seasoning that goes into the broth that takes it from a shoyu to a shio, for example. After the tare, we have our oil, and that's an aromatic oil that gives ramen its fragrance. We'll talk about that in a future video as well. And then we've got our toppings, things like chashu or ajitama seasoned eggs that go on top. I know this all sounds like a lot of information, but don't let it overwhelm you. Come back to this video in a month or two and see how many more of these terms are starting to make sense to you because it's a process, we've got to get through it. We're going to focus today on broth. Now, broth is obviously what people consider to be the, the heart and soul of the ramen. A lot of effort goes into ramen broth. A lot of effort goes into every aspect of ramen, but broth is obviously a great place to start. You can kind of separate your broths into two varieties, a chintan, which is a clear soup, or a, or a paitan. Paitan is a, a, a white soup or a cloudy soup and they're made in very, very different ways. We're gonna do a very, very simple chintan broth today. But what I've got here is the kind of ingredients that would go into any ramen broth. Starting at this side, we've got our bones. You know, we've got chicken and we've got pork. A lot of ramen is made from chicken or pork or a combination of the two, and also from different parts of the animals as well. This is pork neck and backbone here, very meaty flavor that it gives to broths. This is pork leg bone, another slightly different, slightly lighter, porky taste that goes into that. We've got trotters, and I've asked my butcher to cut these in half just to extract more of the flavor. And trotters are gonna give a good mouthfeel to a broth. They're very high in gelatin, so it'll help us to get a good texture in that broth. Really important for all kinds of bones is to make sure that they're cut. You know, a bone has marrow and things on the inside that you really want to release, so make sure your butcher is cutting the leg bones or cutting the trotters in half or cutting these neck and back bones so you can extract the marrow from the inside. Chicken, we've got uh, whole chickens here. You can use chicken frames and carcasses. You can use wings. You can use just chicken breast or, or meat if you want. But I've got whole chickens here. I prefer to use whole chickens because I think they give a much better flavor to a broth. These are actually old chickens, chickens that are sort of older than 45, 50 days, and they're tough. You know, you, you probably wouldn't want to eat these as a roast chicken on a Sunday night, but they are really, really flavorful when you're making soups. I've got chicken feet here as well, which just like the pork trotters, adds a lot of gelatin to the soup. Now here are our basic aromatics. We've got garlic, onion, and ginger. Don't need to go into that too much more. We've got some uh, vegetables here as well. Carrots, spring onions. In Japan, they use what's called negi or Welsh onion, which is a much sort of larger version of this, but spring onion or leek is totally fine. Now let's move along 
to these, dried seafood is such an important part of ramen. And it can be whatever you like, you know, whatever you can get your hands on. These are some dried sardines, dried prawns, dried scallops. This is fish more, the swim bladder of a fish, something that I like to add to ramen quite often. Don't worry if you can't get all of these ingredients, we're not gonna use all of them. Just use what is available to you. Make the ramen your own, essentially. This is katsubushi, dried bonito flakes. You've probably seen them on okonomiyaki or takoyaki, but they're also a really great way of making stock. I've got dried shiitake mushrooms as well. And it's important to use the dried ones because all of these ingredients, essentially, we're using them for their imami, their really strong, savory nature. And dried shiitake mushrooms have a much stronger, savory expression than fresh mushrooms, so always dried mushrooms. And lastly, we've got kombu. Kombu is essentially kelp from Hokkaido in Japan usually, but you can get different kinds of kombu from different places. And this adds a really rich savouriness, a bit of mouthfeel too, slightly slimy texture to it once it's reconstituted, but we use it for that really strong savoury umaminess. There are lots and lots and lots of different varieties of kombu, some Raosu kombu more favoured in Tokyo style cuisine or the shitty kombu from Kyoto. Don't worry about it. Just get some kombu, some kelp that you have available and you can use whatever you like. There are a lot of ingredients that can go into ramen. And ramen is essentially this kind of permutation of how all of these ingredients are put together. One ramen instructor once told me that ramen was not just about the technicality of making the soup, but it was also a combination of philosophy and humour and art and all of these things together, the process of those five elements of the soup, the broth, the noodles, the tare, the oil, and of course the toppings as well, then together with these more philosophical aspects of the ramen, were not additions, they were multiplications. So if any one of those elements was lacking, if it didn't have the right broth, or if it didn't have the right philosophy or the right sense of humour, the end result of the ramen would be zero. We'll get to the philosophy about it later, but let's talk about the nuts and bolts of making stock. So this is all the stuff that can go into stock in different combinations, but let's go for our basic chintan, our clear broth, that is gonna be a lot more simple than what you see here. So let's get rid of everything we don't need and start again from the top. Okay, here we go. It's a lot less intimidating when there's fewer ingredients sitting on the bench. But these are our ingredients for our very basic chintan. And I'm gonna show you what's called a double stock method. A double stock method is something that is so popular in Japan now. It just means you make two different stocks and combine them together. And I think it's the best way to make ramen, so that's how I'm gonna show you. Single stock is just throw everything into a pot, boil it all together. But when you do a double stock, it allows you a lot more variation. It allows you to control things a lot more. You know, things like seafood and meat cook at very different rates, extract at very different rates. So very, very much prefer to do a double stock, but single stock is also possible. Just throw it all into a pot, bring it up to a very, very low simmer, and just let that go. But I'll show you the double stock method of this very basic chinta. A little bit of theory first, before we get into it. When you're making ramen, you want to be in total control. And I would recommend writing your own recipes while you're going through this. And I always keep a spreadsheet or a log of all the different ramens that I've made. You can see here on my own spreadsheet, I list the ingredients by weight. I list the process that goes into it. You can see here that we've got today's date, the fact that this is the 37th broth that I've made of this particular variety. And that allows me to know from the end result what I've done to get there. Because there are so many steps in ramen, it's not something that you can just do by gut feel and expect to get it right every single time. So keep a ramen log. If you want more information on this, let me know and I'll talk a little bit more in a future video about how I prepare the ramen log and the journal. But in terms of the equipment we need, a pot, obviously, metal ruler, which I think is really important so that you can know the dimensions of your pot. You know, this is the pot that I always use for ramen, so I know that it's 15 litres, 28 centimetres across the bottom and 25 centimetres up the side. And that allows me to control how things are cooking with a metal ruler. When you are in school, you probably learned how to measure the volume of a cylinder and you thought you'd never use it again, but here we are. Knowing that this is 25 centimetres up to the top, by measuring inside here to where the top of the water might go, or the stock might go, I know the volume that's in here. That allows me to control the rate of evaporation, etc., etc., etc. We'll get there. Aside from the pot, we've got some scales, so we know the weights of our ingredients. We've got fine mesh to skim scum off the top of the soup, a timer for obvious reasons. Let's get into it. So ramen is sometimes called the universe in a bowl. And they call it that because it's got elements of every aspect of 
the world going into it. We've got meat, we've got seafood, the land and the sea, we've got vegetables, we've got birds, we've got land-dwelling animals. And this is kind of what makes ramen so interesting. The ways you can combine all of this, we're combining it in broth now, but don't forget any of these ingredients can also go into your tare or into your aromatic oil. The other elements of making a bowl of ramen together with your toppings and your noodles, of course. So let me prepare these vegetables and aromatics first. Just some brown onion, I'm gonna cut that in half. And leaving the skin on just gives a very mild, light brown color to the stock, which is what I want. Of course, if you want it to be completely white, you take the skin off. A whole head of garlic in half like that to release the aroma. Some ginger, thick slices, and some carrot as well. No need to peel it, and the only thing we really need to take off is the end there. So now for our meats. The trotter's already cut, so I just measure the weight of that, 700 grams throw it into the pot. Now for my chicken feet. What I need to do here is just take, sounds a bit gross, but the toenails off the end of each toe of the chicken. Now for our chicken, I just wanna cut this up into smaller pieces. We don't have to joint it or anything. I mean, I will just because that's the easiest way to do it. But cutting into the bones of all of these is gonna help us to extract the flavor a lot better. So now I just get about nine liters of water into this and get on the stove. So this is where your metal ruler comes in handy. I know the weights of every ingredient that I put into this pot and I know the size of the pot. And so if I just measure here, I can see that it is now six and a half centimetres from the top. So the next time I do this, rather than measuring out every volume of water, I can just put the water in six and a half centimetres from the top. And that's also going to allow me to work out how much evaporation has gone through the cooking process. So I'll just bring this up to a very, very low simmer and let it go. The meat stock is going, so now for the seafood stock, because we're gonna mix the meat and the seafood stock together, which is why this is called a basic double stock. I'm going as simple as possible, just kombu and katsubushi. These are the two basic ingredients for your classic Japanese ichiban dashi. You could obviously use a lot of other dried seafood in there as well, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I wanna keep things really simple today because this is our very, very first ever ramen broth. So just chicken and pork for the meat stock, kombu katsubushi for the seafood stock. I've got about three liters of cold water in here. I'm just gonna put my kombu straight into the cold water. Katsubushi will go in later, but the thing with kombu is you don't want to boil it. And actually you want to keep it at as low a temperature for as long as possible. You know, kombu extracts fully its flavor at around 60, 65 degrees. So you can actually put the kombu in the cold water and just leave it in the fridge overnight. But I figure while you've got a slow cooking meat broth going already, you may as well do the slow cooking method for heating the kombu. So I'll just put the kombu into the cold water and then put it onto a very, very low heat and slowly bring that up to temperature over the course of about an hour, hour and a half. So after about an hour over medium high heat, this is almost coming to the boil now. And you can see this scum of protein and blood that's forming on top of our stock. We just skim that off with a fine strainer. Once I've removed the scum and not too much more is being produced, I turn that down to a really low temperature. And that's the secret to a chintan or a clear ramen broth. High temperature and vigorous boiling is gonna cause fat molecules to emulsify into the soup and give you a cloudy soup. A lower temperature underneath 100 degrees, so one bubble kind of barely breaking the surface every couple of seconds or so, is gonna keep the broth very, very clear. After about the same time, you can see that our kombu, the water's starting to get warm, a little bit of steam is coming off there. And you test your kombu, just stick your, your thumbnail into the kombu. When that is leaving its imprint, as you can see, it's time to take the kombu out and we can bring this kombu stock to the boil. Once the kombu comes to the boil, dump in the katsubushi, or just for two more seconds, then turn the heat off and let it sit for about half an hour. Then that can be strained out, and that is our clear dashi. The meat stock's been going now for a total of about two hours, and it's looking clear, it's looking flavorful. Now it's time to add in the vegetables, but I want to take a progress measurement here, and this is kind of why we have the metal ruler and the measurement, so we can see how much evaporation is going through. It may seem a little anal to be taking measurements of the stock that you're making, but it's really important. There are so many moving parts to ramen. It's kind of like playing a game of chess. And so just say I eat this ramen at the end of it and it tastes fantastic. I want to know how to recreate that. But even more important than that, if I taste this at the end and go, oh, you know what, that would be better 
if it had a stronger chicken flavor or if it had more seafood, I know what steps I can change, what moves to make on the chessboard so I can actually improve my ramen every time I make an extra batch. Okay, we're about eight and a half centimeters. So I've lost two centimeters in evaporation. Make a note in the ramen journal. In with the aromatics. So my garlic, ginger, carrot, and these onions as well. So our meat stock is looking fantastic. The vegetables have been in for about two hours now, and the whole thing's been going for a little over four hours. And I'll take a final measurement to check how far I've reduced. So we're down to about seven centimeters. It was down to eight and a half, then we added some more stuff in, so obviously the level comes back up, and it's come back down now to seven. So it started off about six and a half, down to eight and a half, back up again to actually about five and now back down to seven. So we have had some reduction, some evaporation there, which is good because it helps intensify the flavor. I'll take this out, pass it through a sieve. I've actually got two sieves here, which I think is quite a useful thing to do. So I'll just scoop out everything from the pot first and pass it through these two sieves. When you've got the bones and things in the sieve, I push it through. I like to give it a good press to make sure we're getting all the flavor out there. I kind of prize the flavor over and above how clear it is. If you want it to be really, really clear, then pushing it obviously is not going to be the best way because you're going to force a few more of the proteins through. You can line it with some extra cheesecloth and muslin, that kind of thing, and don't push it quite as firmly. But I like to give it a good press because I just think it's better to have better flavoured ramen than ramen that just looks more clear. Now you can see from, I guess, what I'm throwing away here that this isn't a stock that is completely, completely broken down. A tintan is, is a clear stock, so it tends to be cooked for a relatively short period of time at a relatively low heat. So it doesn't break apart and break down as much as say a tonkotsu or something else where, I mean, the carrots here are actually quite whole that you can't even squish them too much and the bones aren't falling apart. For a longer cooked stock, and we, when we do some stocks that are sort of eight hours plus, they can really, really break down everything that's inside, the connective tissue, the muscles, the bones, etc., and that becomes almost pasty there. We'll see it with some, uh, I guess, longer cooked stocks later on, but for now, you can not throw this stuff away. You know, there's still actually some flavor in there. We don't want to use it here because it's going to cloud our stock a little bit too much, but you can use this for a secondary stock. You know, you can cover that with water again, boil it again, great for stir frying, just general purpose stock. Both our meat stock and dashi have both been strained. I'm sorry, there's a lot of pouring, a lot of liquid management that needs to happen when you're making large volumes of ramen. And now we just mix the two together. Well, this is what we spent the last six hours of our life putting together, our chintan basic double stock. Not just this, I've got 10 odd liters of it. And that's the great thing about making stock like this. I can freeze all of this and use this whenever I want to make ramen. It's not that I've got to invite 40 of my closest friends around and have a bowl of ramen for everyone. But it may look slightly cloudy here, but that's just because I've been pouring it around. It's got to settle a little bit, the fat molecules will come to the top and it'll be crystal clear by the time it comes out of the fridge tomorrow when we're closer to making our ramen. You can't just throw noodles into a stock like this because as we mentioned before, there are five elements that are essential to ramen. We've got the broth, that's this. Next, we're talking about the noodles. We're not gonna make our own noodles at the beginning of ramen school. We'll get to that later down the track, but this hasn't been seasoned at all. I put no salt into it whatsoever. That comes from the tare. So when we get to building our ramen, tare is the important aspect that actually seasons the ramen. We'll talk about that more when we get to that. We're moving on from this in ramen school. We're gonna go into toppings, chashu, ajitama, some of the things that we put on top of the ramen. And I'm sorry I don't have a bowl of ramen to show you today, because we've just made the stock. But after a couple of videos, follow through on this playlist and you will end up with the secrets to making fantastic ramen.